fall of 2020. And speaking of that, let's bring in right now a member of the Finance and the Intelligence Committee's Democratic Senator Michael Bennett of Colorado. Yesterday, the senator launched his bid for President of the United States. And des despite uh, my op-ed uh, that uh, mm -hmm. they named you the second coming, coming of Abraham Lincoln and George Washington, <laughs> we have never met before, I don't think. So it's good to have you on, Well, oh, I'm glad to be here, although I came all the way to New York and you're not here, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, we're, you know, so we're not I, actually I, I, meeting. I mean, this is well, <laughs> close, en Next close time. enough. I mean, seriously, if I had been in the same room with you, given my op-ed, I may have swooned. So maybe this is that safe. Yeah, maybe it's good. I, I, I know Just that's not yeah, space. No. So, so, Senator, let's start by, first of all, let's just talk about the news out today. Uh, unemploy the unemployment rate's at 3.6%. Wages aren't great, but they're better than they've, they've been. Job participation rate is not great, but it's better than it's been. Yep. Um, how do you defeat a president that has uh, an economy that's spurring along with unemployment below 4%? Well, first of all, I think you made an important point, which is this has been growing almost in a straight line since 2009. Uh, when at the depths of the recession Barack Obama took over. Those job numbers, they're slightly better this month, but they've basically gone in a straight line. So I'll give credit for Donald Trump for not screwing it up for the first two years that he was here. The biggest problem facing this country, though, economically, is that for 40 years, wages have been flat. And you just heard it on the report that we didn't get the wage growth that we thought we would see. And the result of that in my state, Colorado, which has one of the most dynamic economies on the planet, people cannot afford housing, health care, higher education, or early childhood education. When I say people, I mean almost everybody. And that means people in my state and all across the country cannot afford a middle class life that we used to take for granted in the in the united states i can't right. blame so, that so on donald trump he hasn't been president for forty years but it is something mm -hmm. that we have to address as a country if this democracy is going to survive and by the way that's how i think you take yep. donald trump on which is he is d completely destroying and trashing the democracy you talk about economic and political sclerosis you talk about immobility that many Americans, certainly Trump voters and before that Obama voters, have felt through the years. Uh, what do you do that every other president over the past generation has not been able to do to bring an end to that not only economic sclerosis, but also the political sclerosis that still seizes Washington? So on the economic sclerosis, I think there are a lot of things we could do. We could build infrastructure again in this country. We could have an antitrust uh, legal regime that actually uh, went after large actors that aren't producing jobs in this country and help small businesses start. We could do a better job of small business formation and make sure people were getting access to credit. In the meantime, we could pass my bill, the American Family Act, which would dramatically increase the child uh, tax credit in this country, giving middle class families a huge boost and uh, reducing childhood poverty in America by 40 percent. That would be the biggest hit to poverty in America since Medicaid was passed. President after president after president hasn't done that. By the way, it would cost 3 percent of what Medicare for all would cost, 3 percent. And you'd reduce childhood poverty in this country by 40 percent two and a half times less than Donald Trump's tax cut for the for the wealthy. So those are the things those are the kinds of things on the economic side we could do in terms of the political sclerosis. That is a debate that we're having in the Democratic Party. My strong view is that we should not make matters worse. We are destroying our institutions in Washington. And there are some people who say we should just go down that rabbit hole. My view is that if you are not the if you are not the party who believes that government is um, is the problem trying to destroy our country, going that down that road is an invitation to the Freedom Caucus and to Mitch McConnell to say, keep destroying our institutions. We have to rebuild those institutions. And we have to serve um, people in my state that are a third Republican, independent, and Democratic, understanding that they don't have the same opinion about everything, but they want to drive economic growth in this country that's broadly based. They want to do the right thing for their kids, and they want to do the right thing 
for this country's place in the world. It's been a long time since we've all tried to do that as Americans. I think that's what we need to do after this next election is over. Senator, when you got in the race yesterday, you joined a long list of candidates. I believe we're at 22 now, which means we can have a full pickup football game, 11 on 11. And there are many of your fellow senators in the race. There are mayors, there are governors, there's a former vice president. So when Americans look at that field, why should they sit up and pay attention to you? What's different about you than even some of your Senate colleagues? Well, first of all, if we're doing a football pickup game, I want Cory Booker, who is That's an all American. That's a great American. call. Tight end. He's yeah, my first Stanford. choice. Exactly. Good draft pick. Uh, yes. and, a, and a great guy. Look, I think it's an amazing moment in, our, in the party's history to have this many people running. I think I'm actually the 21st, not the 22nd. Sure. Okay. When I told my mom then. that somebody had to be 22nd. It turned out I was <laughs> 21st, so I'll take it. Uh, I think it's amazing. We have Look, the American people really don't know at this moment what the Democratic Party stands for. We have the chance now to have a, a real competition of ideas in the party. The country needs that competition of, of ideas. It actually needs it between a normal Republican Party and the Democratic Party as well. But among Democrats, we need to do it. And I think I bring to it a certain experience in the Senate over the last 10 years of getting bipartisan results, even when the place was cratering, cratering around us. And I've spent time in business, and I've spent time um, running the Denver Public Schools as a superintendent in kids' schools and classrooms who are largely ignored by our political system, have been largely ignored by our political system for the last 100 years. Mm. I'd like to bring their voices to this conversation to make sure that we're driving opportunity for them instead of marooning them in schools that are not going to uh, allow them to meaningfully participate in the democracy and the economy. So, you know, I think everybody in this race has strengths and weaknesses, and I, I hope people will see that I have some of those, too. One of the divisions within this field is on the question of health care. Uh, there are some candidates who want Medicare for all. That's become sort of a litmus test question. Another group of candidates, including you, who say Medicare with a public option, an opt-in. In other words, it's not for everybody, but you've got the option to get in. Right. Why is that a better idea than Medicare for all? So first, let me say what unites this field is we all believe in universal right. coverage. What unites this field is we all believe that America is spending too much on health care and American families are spending too much on health care. What unites this field is we want to preserve quality in our in our in our insurance yeah. and our health care and you would think every american would want that and to go back to my point every republican i know in colorado wants that not to mention democrats and independents but you have a president who since the day he was in office has tried to take health care away from americans in fact has succeeded at doing that has made it more expensive for americans never delivered on the promise that he made to have a beautiful health care system that was going to cost so little and cover everybody and you're going to love it all lies I believe my suggestion about Medicare X is a better alternative than, than Medicare for All, in part because I think Medicare for All takes insurance away from 180 million people, 80 percent of whom like it in the private market. If you were sitting in a living room in, in, any, in any community in my state and said, we want universal coverage, we want to reduce costs, we want to increase quality, but we have to start by taking insurance away from half of you. The answer would be, no, you're not going to start by doing that. Do you have some other idea? And I think that other idea is a robust public option that gives people a choice whether they want to be in it or not. I, I just went through you know, a cancer operation. I, I, and I can tell you, having been through that, and then my kid, who's 14 years old, had an appendectomy seven days after I was, uh, had surgery myself, that I felt very strongly that I want to be able to make that choice for myself and my family. My option of Medicare X allows people to do that. I think it makes it uh, much more likely that it would ever pass than something that takes away that insurance. Remember, when Barack Obama said, if you like your insurance, you can keep it, and several hundred thousand people lost it, we're still recovering from that. And, and what we're saying now with Medicare for All is, if you like your insurance, we're going to take it away from you. I don't mm -hmm. think that's going to work. Quickly, how is your health and what's your prognosis? Oh, it's great. Voters will be wondering. No, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I really am. I mean, I was, I was, uh, they said I had cancer, and then five weeks later, I was free of cancer. Yeah. And, you know, I thought a lot about what it would mean for me or anybody else to get a diagnosis like that and not have insurance. My operation cost $53,000. Insurance paid for almost all of that. That would have bankrupted a lot of people in this country that don't have health insurance. 
And now you've got a president who's literally taking insurance away from people with pre-existing conditions. I mean, that is the important yeah. dividing line, it seems to me, in this election, not the disagreement we, we have as Democrats. We should fight that out during a primary and see who's successful. Well, that's great news. Glad to hear Thank you. Thank you. Well. No, I appreciate your asking. Uh, you mentioned schools and the school system in Denver that you used to run. Uh, we came into this segment with an economic report, and we're always talking about the gross national product. So let me ask you about the gross national product that is lost, creativity, imagination of kids in K through 8 in school systems around this country who are not taught as well as they ought to be taught. No fault of the teachers. It's just that they're, 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 it's like a factory. What do we do about this most, in my view, one of the most critical components of this country, the future of these children who are lost in class. So let's say, first of all, let me agree, no fault of the teachers. Second, certainly no fault of the kids. Right. So, you know, I think the, the old philosopher's trick of think, imagining a society where, you, you know, you're born not knowing where you're going to end up, whose family you're going to be in. When it comes to public education, uh, if you're born poor in this country, unfortunately, it's a disaster for you. And we have no, almost no decent preschool for kids that are living in poverty. We have almost de no decent K-12 schools. There are cities and neighborhoods all over America that no senator would send their kid to any of the schools. Yet we're expecting kids to go there and, and do well. And then, of course, it's really hard for kids to be able to afford college. And there's almost no quality skills training for kids that don't want to go to college. All that stuff sounds totally obvious, Mike, like, you know, like vanilla stuff. We're not doing it almost for any kids in America, and especially for kids living in poverty. So the loss in human potential, even before you get to GDP, uh, is enormous. I, I don't think there's anything more at war with who we are as Americans than the idea that if you're born poor in this country, your chances of getting a college degree or its equivalent are nine in a hundred. Mm -hmm. Nine in a hundred. Which means to the economic growth question, 91 of our kids, because of the savageness of this 21st century economy, are constrained to the margins of the democracy and the margins of the economy for nothing they ever did. You know, and our system, I mean, just to finish the thought, was designed deep in the last century and in the century before that. I mean, think about it. We've got teachers all over the country that can't afford to live you know, in the cities where they teach. Denver has become one of those places. When I was superintendent, one of the great things about Denver was that teachers could actually afford to own houses and live in apartments there. That's no longer true. When you think about how we pay teachers, it is the same system that we had when we had a labor market that discriminated against women and said, you've got two professional choices. One's being a teacher and one's being a nurse. Yeah. You know? And if you don't mm. like hospitals and you don't like blood, then come teach Julius Caesar every year for 30 years of your life. And we're going to, since no one will hire you to be an astronaut or on MSNBC or anything else, we're going to pay you this ridiculously low current compensation. You're going to stay here for 30 years, which you won't anymore, and we'll give you a pension. Uh, which sounded pretty good to you back then because your spouse was going to die. Today, you're not going to be there 30 years. Today, you know that pension's not being funded. Nobody in America is paying anybody like that. And in the old days, we used that labor market to sub that discrimination in the labor market, which thank goodness doesn't exist in the same profound way that it used to. We used that discrimination to subsidize our public education system and to say, you know what, kids, you are going to be lucky enough to get the best English literature t uh, kid in her class to come teach you because we're not going to let her do anything else except be a nurse. Those days have been over for 50 years, and yet we're still paying people this way. I mean, it's one of, the, one of m many illustrations of the kind of transformational change we need to make as a country, not just in Washington. Washington can't solve this problem, but all over the country if we're going to drive the kind of opportunity we need to drive. All right, Senator Michael Bennett, thank you very much for being on the show. Good luck to you. Thanks for having and me. Thanks, Senator. I hope we'll see you next up time. Up next. Joe, yes. we definitely will see you. Joe Biden learned the hard way that progressives weren't too pleased with his recent praise of Mike Pence. Four years earlier, it was Dick Cheney who Biden was praising. I actually like Dick Cheney for real. I, I get on with him. I think he's a decent man. 
So, so how's that going that? on with the base, Mika? <laughs> well, we'll talk about it when Morning Joe That's comes back. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube. And make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. And you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.